Um, one of the first things that uh, is on my mind is the economy of love. So we have to think about this because we're looking at some quite serious economic disruptions potentially and uh, finding methods for local organizations to be able to participate and encourage positive activity is is really <coughs> important so we're going to learn a little bit about that i'm pretty sure <clears throat> and i'm excited because i'm going to see max and the other people at Sekim in egypt soon so that's exciting for me i have been there before but uh, it's always good to go there and there's also the other camp that we have in in uh, Nueva called the Habiba camp which is exciting and then we have the COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh which I have gotten accreditation to so I'll be able to go in there and communicate from the COP and you know I, I, I'm, I'm not expecting too much from COPs because I have too much experience and it is the 27th COP and I think if you really take this, the climate change issues seriously, you only need one cop. But now 27 cops later, we're still not really, we don't really have an, uh, an agreement. But as I understand it, um, Peter is going to share some camp information with us. And then we're gonna to go to Maximilian for uh, a uh, presentation from him from the Wahat new community and the new camp in Wahat in Egypt. It's going to be exciting. Thanks for coming, everyone, and welcome to the Fireside Chat. And for those of you who think, John, that's short. We're not used to that being that short. There will be plenty of the opportunity to talk to John after the presentations because he will stay probably stay around uh, for the further conversations that will follow. Uh, indeed, I am to present. Uh, what the camps are doing. I will share my screen. I'm not sure if there's a video clip in that, but um, we'll find out. I hope everyone can see it without weird gray boxes uh, everywhere. Um, just a quick update from what's happening uh, in this, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the, what we now call the mighty movement around the world to restore uh, our degraded uh, ecosystems and our degrading ecosystems. First, our program um, and our household uh, announcements to hold your questions until after uh, Max has, uh, has presented. You can ask things in the chat and we will record them um, and then use them, but best probably we're only a group of 30 people to, is to raise your hand. And there's a little icon you can find somewhere in your Zoom interface that will raise your hand. We'll see it and we'll give you the floor and we can have a real conversation instead of just repeating what people typed. Uh, the session will last an hour, uh, but do feel free to stay on for uh, a longer and open discussion. I promised my family I will cook uh, at seven, so I will have to leave at seven my time. It's currently uh, five o'clock, so we have plenty of time left. Um, quickly, what's happening now uh, within the camps movement and things you can participate in. If you're in Ireland or if you're willing to travel to Ireland, uh, Schulte Cree is uh, organizing uh, quite a few things in the next few weeks. Uh, regenerative farming course for local farmers, I guess then you'll have to be a local farmer to participate that. There is a herbal medicine course and there's a plant propagation course uh, being planned at Shelter Creek for people to participate in. Uh, Altiplano is uh, going to get very busy with planting trees. They have to put 10,000 of those in the ground uh, before May and is inviting people to come and help. Every single hand is uh, very welcome to come and help plant those trees. Uh, Amber Coombe is uh, running another really interesting and in-depth uh, rewilding course this weekend already. Um, I don't know how flexible you are, but if you're willing and able to participate, uh, it's quite an experience. In South Africa, Tolego is uh, recognized, uh, sorry, facilitating a permaculture course. 
and I guess the word recognized means you can get a certificate. And then in California, uh, Camp Coyote with Leo is running a workshop uh, between the 13th and 15th of November with education, action, and connection at Indian Canyon, including uh, fire mimicry and insights into traditional ecological knowledge. If you're interested, you'll be welcome to join them. Uh, John just mentioned Habiba community. Uh, they invite you to come to the, and I've been there, really very beautiful Sinai Peninsula for an educational program uh, in environmental restoration um, in the first two weeks of December. All of these events can be found on our website. And I will immediately admit that it might be a bit laborious to find these things right now, but the team is working very hard to building a new uh, interface between you and what the camps are doing, where you can search on date, location, and whatever else you're looking for, and it should make it much easier to find uh, relevant events you can go to. And quite happily, in the post, hopefully post-pandemic world, we'll see how the winters go. Uh, it is possible to participate in restoration again. We haven't been able for such a long time. The big announcement from our side is that the Global Earth Repair Summit is taking place uh, this month. Uh, it's an online and offline event uh, planning to bring together uh, the grassroots ecosystem restoration movement from around the world in a four day event. Uh, there will be talks, workshops, networking, uh, circles. Uh, there's even something called an unconferencing schedule where you can basically schedule your own conference during the conference without having to go through some uh, scrutiny uh, committee first. And there's a special aid of action at some of the ecosystem restoration camps around the world on the 23rd of October. And all that will be listed on the Global Earth Repair Summit site. And we'll share the link to that event site in the chat as we speak, Kath. Uh, we, as ecosystem restoration camps, are also organizing a symposium during the Global Earth Repair Summit uh, on a situation that many around the world are facing, and that is water scarcity. Uh, quick runoff, very little water fall falling, droughts are, are, are causing quite some problems. And uh, on the screen, you'll see all the different times you could join. We've tried to pick a time where most people are awake uh, to participate in that symposium on uh, repairing the earth in times of water scarcity. Uh, put it in your diary. Uh, more details and our speaker lineup, which we're still working on, is coming through uh, to you via our email newsletter and our social posts, hopefully this week. Then uh, some other news from camps. Uh, Pachacuti in Peru. Uh, is helping uh, new landowners see and understand the value of preserving the old. I was muted by someone by accident, I assume, Kath. Uh, I don't know if what I, where I was muted, but local farmers and community members helped the new landowners see and understand the value of preserving the old growth forest instead of logging the wood for economic purposes. Uh, which is still a problem uh, in many places. And then in South Africa, uh, and I know the Pachamama, there's someone here. Welcome, by the way. Camp Green Pop and Camp Pachamama have joined forces for a massive tree planting day on the 5th of October, which can't be true because that's that's six days ago as part of, or, well, it's news, sorry, as part of Green Pop's annual Eden Festival of Action. Um, and 1,500 trees were planted. So you can't participate anymore. Uh, then in California, the land and uh, Camp uh, Paradise are expanding their restoration efforts by purchasing new land in their surroundings. If you know of any opportunities, please reach out to us through the email address listed here. It will also be in the chat. That's our general email address. And then in Belgium, Pacha Land hired a soil lab manager um, who is, uh, and I've seen her work, really uh, working very well also with the community to teach them how soil micro life works and how important that is. And then in the Philippines, good news, the 2022 Permaculture Magazine Award went to Camp Regenesis, 
uh, and that's uh, very welcome because they were hit by a typhoon not too long ago and need to repair quite a few things. So um, I think this is the final slide, but uh, I'll say it. If you have friends who haven't joined the movement yet, please do invite them. And I'll just be very honest with you. The inflation rates, crises are actually causing quite a few people to stop being donor to what we're doing, which is not what we were hoping for. So if you have or if you know someone with the means and aren't donating yet, please persuade them to join us. I will repeat that at the end because uh, all these wonderful people do do need also financial support, not just a thumbs up. That's it for me. Stop sharing. And I would love to give the desert floor, in this case, to Max, uh, all the way from Egypt. Max. Hello, hello, everybody. Salam alaikum from Egypt, Western Desert, uh, the Wahad Farm. Um, I want to just quickly introduce people around me. We have uh, Xenia here. Hello. She's from Russia and joined uh, more than a year ago and helping also with the sustainability work. We have Nicolas from, Hi, everyone. from France. And we have Victor. Hello. Victor from Netherlands. And who is missing is uh, one of our um, team members here, the farm manager, but he's on a well uh, deserved vacation for some more days. And I I want to really show you this beautiful view around oh, us. This is the um, this is the great valley of the uh, Wahad uh, Desert uh, and the uh, Bahareya region in the, in the Western Desert. Um, yeah, it's really uh, inspirational uh, moment. Um, they're sitting here with. Uh, the campus, uh, the volunteers coming to join us through the network. I'm really happy. Actually, they landed three days ago uh, in, in Egypt. And just uh, yesterday, we arrived here on the farm. Um, but now, let me please um, share the screen uh, about the um, yeah, pre presentation that I'm going to hold. Just one second. Yes. So, can you see it? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm going to make the view um, slideshow. So, here we go. Um, this is the Sikkim Farm, um, the camp in Wahat. And there's an automatic uh, slide. Uh, uh, I don't know. Shit. There is an automatic slide uh, skipper, um, and that is a little bit um, uh, a technical issue here. But uh, I, I hope that um, yeah, I will I will manage somehow. So uh, I wanted to say that we are uh, actually inspired from the Sekem vision uh, and see life always in four dimensions. It is an important point to make because as an ecosystem restoration camp um, we are active in different spheres of life and you can say that in the beginning of course the ecological life is very critical as a basis for the rest but um, it is also very important to mention that we are embedded in a value creation stream that can um, provide uh, finance for um, investments that are needed to develop the land and to reclaim desert land. And of course, the profits that are made are um, reinvested into um, cultural life and into an expansion of the reclamation areas. And uh, in all these fields, we have different goals. And uh, working together and expanding into uh, the villages around us is not only a task that we tackle in our mother farm at Sikkim, uh, nearby um, Cairo in the Delta, but also here. So this kind of 
um, a, this, this kind of holistic development approach is something that we are trying to uh, replicate here on the desert farm, and we have um, the yeah the the huge chance to learn from the experience from the last years. And the logic is, of course, that everything needs needs a, a vision, and, um, and and then it needs some research uh, to create prototypes. And these prototypes are then being upscaled. Yes, of course, yes. And, uh, and what you see here is part of our upscaling momentum because some things that we do here, we already prototyped somewhere else. So we, this is a farm and this is a context for upscaling and showing that this is not only a one shot uh, in, in history, but this is possible to replicate with uh, other people at other places in the desert. Um, SECAM has a wide institutional ecosystem. I want to mention that because I don't want to create the um, impression that this is happened in the last um, 10 years just from scratch. No, we are building on a strong ecosystem where this farm here around me is embedded in. And this ecosystem, like I say, uh, is, is uh, coming from uh, or is active in the four main areas of life. So we have a university helping us. We have a, a holding company that is producing products and creating value out of the raw materials. And we have an association of farmers that delivers technical assistance to our engineers. And we have students coming around to support our community life here and uh, engage in community-based learning. So, and, and there's um, SICAM Friends associations around the world also in, in the Netherlands, um, who are supporting us uh, to make this work possible. And I, I wanted to highlight how important this network is, how important it is to have partners who uh, go hand in hand to make this possible. So Wahat is a place in the Western Egyptian desert, um, which is really far away from Cairo, Actually, um, you, you need almost six hours uh, from our main farm to this oasis here. And this oasis uh, has roughly 2,000 square kilometers and uh, is kind of surrounded by a valley or is a valley. So it has a very precise geographical um, um, setup. Around 30,000 people live here and it's in a very uh, arid climate zone. And Max? Uh, yes? Sorry, just to interrupt you for a second. We're really loving what you're sharing with us, but it's quite difficult to hear. Is there a way you could place something next to the mic just to try and shield it a little bit from, from the wind? Um, um, it's, it's, um, it's challenging. No, but we, we appreciate can... that. <laughs> Um, maybe just try and shield the mic a little with your hand or if somebody else could do that for you. We don't want to miss anything you're sharing with us. Okay, so maybe we just try to go inside um, and you give me just one second and then we will do it from the room and we hope that the network is uh, keeping intact, okay? John, John, John suggested John, John, in the John, chat, chat that if that you have a book, Place it around the mic on three sides and the, and the open side have the mic there. You take that, these, these things. Well, Max is moving to a less interesting but wind-free place. There he is. May I invite you to write down in the chat where you are? I'd be really curious. Uh, uh, some people have done it. We are quite curious to see who else is here. I don't, Hello. Hear, I don't hear the wind, but the sound didn't improve. Say something else, Max. You froze. I think outside and wind is a better choice because now we hear nothing. Check. I'm back. 
Yeah, but your connection did not improve. Check again, microphone. Yeah, no, no background noise, but your connection is poor. Okay, I, we are replacing the mobile uh, internet. It hopefully works. Yeah, you're, you're uh, solid now. It's better? Yes, much better. Okay. Sorry for that interruption. Uh, yeah, bear with me, my dear friends from all over the world. I think every one of you knows about this uh, situations, and we are indeed on a desert farm. So what can we do? <laughs> but I'm thank you for your patience. Um, yeah, so far so good. We are currently uh, really here in the middle of uh, the of nowhere and. The important fact here, which is, comes later also as a challenge, is that this is based on a water uh, that is fossil, uh, the Nubian aquifer, and uh, uh, it is one. It is the biggest aquifer in the world. Um, but this is uh, good to know for a context situation. Um, then, what what we have uh, as a next slide is a typical. Um, before and after setting, when you see on the upper right, it's really looking like bare sand. And after years of testing, also with different irrigation methods, we have found out that the uh, pivot irrigation system, the circular irrigation system, is a very robust system that allows for uh, large scale restoration and can deal very well with uh, the high iron content in the water that is making it difficult for any kind of tubes uh, to survive. We have to realize that every irrigation is artificial and every irrigation needs to be uh, driven by, uh, by the human um, uh, intention. And uh, between the pivot systems, you have rooms to make uh, a tree planting possible and on the borders, etc. But we we can see that um, the the uh, this is part of our strategy to reclaim larger areas here. And on the community uh, front or on the on the camp front, um, there are some facts I want to share. Okay, we have around one thousand hectare that are uh, laying in front of us, and uh, ar around fifty employees are uh, working with us, and there is a. A significant amount also of uh, daily workers helping us for seasonal work and uh, of course now uh, happy happy to announce that we have two volunteers here with us and um, the irrigation uh, the reclamation work started technically in 2008 but then the revolution came and so on so there was a somehow a stagnation in the first part of the farm and then 2019, we took uh, another effort also uh, driven by partner support and by crowdfunding to move into the new areas of the farm with the uh, a circular pivot irrigation that you have seen. All what, you, what we do here on the farm is uh, based on biodynamic principles and part of the economy of love uh, uh, value creation stream. The uh, first, as we are, we can say we have uh, reclaimed one third of the area so far and planted around 350,000 trees. And uh, we have much more room for more trees in, in between the pivots and uh, on some of the uh, boundaries or borders to the mountains. So um, we, <clears throat> we have become somehow experts in planting a mix of trees uh, in, a, in, a, in a larger, let's say, scale based on artificial irrigation. And uh, this is a very good uh, element for windbreaks and for attracting um, um, biodiversity, but also for capturing carbon, as we will see later. We're planting a lot of uh, 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 seasonal crops like um, mint or chamomile or uh, lemongrass, uh, sometimes even, um, uh, yeah, calendula or, or, or thyme or aromatic and herbs and so on, aromatic plants. But we also have <clears throat> perennial crops, uh, jojoba namely, or date palms. Date palms are actually 
the, the, the most spread crops here in the oasis. Uh, farmers traditionally rely on date palms. Um, when, we have a, when we have had a look on biodiversity, we could see that on the one hand, of course, when we are getting active here, somehow the desert ecosystem that has existed here for maybe um, the thousands of years, uh, that, the, that somehow this uh, ecosystem is um, kind of replaced by a more rich, biodiverse ecosystem. So we, we like to uh, think more about of ecosystem development and not so much about ecosystem restoration. And what we can see here in the first years that we have a high increase of insects, birds and plants and we are also engaged in introducing here the uh, local uh, uh, do uh, domestic uh, Lamarki bee that we know from the Delta, also here with some support of our experts. Uh, in the beginning, when we started this uh, uh, farm, it, it was also driven uh, by uh, diesel generators. Now, since maybe 2018 and, and onwards, it was very good uh, and, and, and financially feasible to uh, only expand by renewable energy and to replace existing generators with renewable energy uh, panels, PV panels, in order to run the solar pumping systems. And right now we have around one and a half megawatt uh, installed, all with the help of our local partners, including the Heliopolis University and our vocational training center, who has managed to come up with a local design for these uh, chaussees and for the design of the um, yeah, electric uh, uh, wiring and so on. Uh, one of the bigger projects that we are currently doing is to try to use a mountain elevation for storing water over the day to irrigate at night by mechanical, by gravity, because when you're using renewable energy, uh, uh, it only functions during the day and that's not the optimal time for irrigation. But our aim is to uh, find out how we can irrigate by night without using batteries. Yeah, over the course of the time, more and more community spaces have been created. We have set up recreational areas. We have set up a farm cafeteria or enlarged it to host more than uh, 200 people. And we have a local bakery for making our own bread. We also have created a community space from the beginning on because that's what, what we really uh, see as a very important element in, in community building. <clears throat> when Ibrahim Abulesh, the founder of Sekem, um, started uh, Sekem and, and he got his first loan from a bank, he was investing into a tractor and he was also investing into a piano because he knew how important cultural life is for, uh, for the development of uh, a community and hence uh, for the basis for desert reclamation. And here you see also parts of our students and artistic team to make a show or an event with a so-called space of culture that is also active here on this remote part of the desert. Um, here you see some work in progress. These are uh, uh, buildings that we are using for a new school and a new kindergarten that has been built. It's almost finished now. The children are already enrolled in classrooms that are uh, still improvised, but what you can see here is really an amazing work of some research done to build local materials from local uh, building materials, so from <clears throat> rammed earth. Because in the whole region here, education is uh, not uh, so much um, uh, available for people in, in an adequate setting. So more schools are needed. And our community um, always had this as part of the design and ed educational elements. Yeah, as I said before, uh, Nicolas and Victor uh, are here with, with us. And I, I hope to give them also the floor and have enough time in the end so they can share their first impressions. The economy of love 
that John mentioned is something you can find out yourself. You just have to screen the QR code here on the, on the bottom left. It's a standard that is combining cultural, economic, social, and ecological life into a, a framework that makes um, consumer decisions more feasible and assures integrity to our values. Because we want to show that um, the impact of your consumer's choice of the products to the consumer. And hence we have a transparent uh, a kind of documentation from every step in the value chain from the farm <clears throat> to the final product. And under this economy of love, you also have uh, the integration of carbon credits um, that I will mention now. Um, carbon credits uh, can be viewed as a critical, uh, but also as a promising uh, development. But um, without focusing now too much on the, on the risk of having carbon credits kind of perpetuating um, let's say uh, industries that are polluting and kind of um, seeing the risk that those people and companies who strong polluters can kind of offset their emissions and no, do not change. I want to highlight the opportunity behind for those companies who still have unavoidable emissions and who want to neutralize themselves. Actually, when you are doing uh, biodynamic agriculture in the desert or anywhere else, and you're using compost and renewable energy, you have a wonderful, fantastic way of removing carbon from the atmosphere and put it into the soil and put it into the trees. And while doing compost, you avoid emissions. And there are internationally recognized methodologies and uh, also uh, accredited ways um, that are standardized to measure those emission uh, avoidances or um, removal of carbon from the atmosphere. And it's a fantastic opportunity to create a value for the farmer that is recognized by the market. Because what we can see is actually um, that these carbon credits come along with a lot of co-benefits. It's not a carbon credit that is generated somewhere uh, and depending on the sales of this carbon credit. It is a carbon credit that comes as a good co-benefit from a farmer doing their work. So it's a recognition of, of, the, of the value of a farmer, a farmer's work. And it comes hand in hand with a lot of co-benefits. So uh, for one carbon credit, you, you have a certain amount of soil sequestered, you have a certain amount of carbon, uh, of compost produced, and some trees are planted. And it's wonderful because in average, a farmer can increase his or her income by 30%. And this is a breakthrough for an economic barrier that has been always an argument in the conversion from conventional to organic. So there's actually uh, now uh, uh, the possibility that this extra income stream is available for farmers, which is a great game changer. We actually experienced that ourselves, and I come in a minute to the dynamic to COP. We have done it in our own farm here, sitting now on the farm in Wahat, we have reclaimed this 830 acres and uh, with all the elements of planting trees and soil carbon and compost and so on, we have generated 12,000 carbon credits per year, which is a value of 300,000 uh, euros per year that we have to invest into a reclamation activity that was before not profitable and not easy to finance. And you have to understand that for desert reclamation, you, you have to invest some years before you have the richness of the soil, before you actually become profitable. But with, with carbon credits, it's possible from the first year on to finance that expansion. And it's something that we want to make all our farmers uh, being, um, uh, that we want to uh, make available to all our farmers. And we are prototyping it with our 2,100 farmers that work with us in all Egypt. And of course, uh, uh, when the COP doors are opening, we are telling the story of you can do this for not only uh, uh, our farmers, you can do that for a lot of farmers. I mean, these numbers are a little bit um, um, constructed, but if you just play it through and say 250,000 farmers 
uh, with uh, 1.6 million acres, which is maybe around 15% of the area of uh, Egypt, you can actually help them to convert to organic and plant more trees and do more compost with a certain amount of investment and you can generate a lot of funding. Funding that is available from industries or companies that are willing to pay for uh, their unavoidable emissions. And that's a real argument for, uh, for climate change mitigation and uh, the, the, let's say, the, the industry or the, the economy and the science uh, are recognizing this. And we hope that COP27 will be a breakthrough for this message because it will have so much benefits for the farmers. Um, of course, you cannot tackle 250,000 farmers from scratch. So one approach is to go by regions. And as I said in the beginning, we are sitting here in a region called Baharea, uh, Wahat, the oasis of Baharea. And together with common land, we are developing, a or we use the common lands for returns a, a, a approach and framework that is very much connected to the economy of love to a, a build a roadmap for this whole region to develop and just Tomorrow and after tomorrow, we have a workshop here where we invite around 80, 90 stakeholders from the region in order to create a first kind of um, dreaming map of how could this region look like in 20 years or more and how can we create inspiration, how can we use our social capital, how can we develop nature and ecosystems and how can we do this with a financial also return. So we are creating a huge momentum here in this region uh, with the help of our partners. Of course, as I mentioned, the challenges are there. The water source is for sale, but this aquifer is very huge. The water is available for more than 100 years, even under the scenario of reclaiming half of the desert uh, here in this region. Um, so there has been models that show that uh, this is possible. And uh, uh, yeah, I think if, if ecosystem functionality is valued, then the technology and funding should be available also to prolong this availability of water. I'm talking about desalination or even large scale restoration that can change weather patterns. Right now we have huge climate, uh, uh, extreme climate conditions with a lot of temperature changes, fluctuations, especially in the winter. But with a large scale restoration, we can tackle that. And it has to go hand in hand with the education and basic infrastructure, like, for example, waste management, etc. And what we can see is that the whole market here is not really functional. The anonymous market is not helping. You need partners who build, uh, who, who trust, and who pay the right price for uh, uh, commodities that come from the farm. So we have to also engage in such an economy of love paradigm shift in order to make this region um, move ahead. And we hope that the people uh, will understand this and will like this and will contribute to it. So far, so good. Um, I leave it with that. I thank you so much for the, um, for the, for the uh, attention. And of course, I would like to uh, invite also now my dear uh, colleagues here uh, to share a little bit of first impressions because they just landed yesterday and maybe they, they want to share a little bit. Well, hello everyone, my name is uh, Victor, like Mark said, I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, a few days ago, we arrived on the main farm of Sekum in Cairo. Uh, I was already very impressed with what they've uh, done there since, uh, since the late, late 70s. Uh, and yesterday we arrived here in Bahat. Um, also very impressive what has been done so far. And uh, yes, I'm very excited to uh, contribute to uh, several projects uh, which are going on here. Uh, so yeah, very excited for coming times. Hi, um, I'm Nico from France, and this Victor, we're going to be volunteer for, yeah, here at the Wahat Farm. And yeah, just arrived uh, yesterday here and very impressed by um, this environment, which is uh, brand new for me. I've never been to a desert. So yeah, pretty excited to discover um, this. And um, yeah, as Max finished, there is a lot of challenges, but as well as a lot of opportunities that we will be investigating with Victor and with the 
do our team here in Wahat. So yeah, very excited to start this journey and uh, yeah, uh, let's go it. Let's go for it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I can share a little bit also because uh, it's actually my only my second time in this farm, though I stay in the second almost a year. Uh, and uh, my first excursion here was kind of brief and short, just a couple of hours to look around. And this time I came here for like five days, so I have more chill time uh, to explore more things. And still, I think for me, it's... Um, the landscapes here I would describe as breathtaking because uh, it's something about the desert itself. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know, you can compare it to the sea. It's limitless. Uh, you look at this and you experience everything uh, that, um, I don't know, it can, can't compare it to any other landscape that exists. Uh, and um, yeah, the way uh, the job that second done here is incredible as well because everything you see here it's uh, like full of green spaces and the birds are singing around in the desert and you can find uh, I don't know frogs here uh, again in the desert and it's just mind blowing so yes for me it's incredible as well. I hope that gives some of you appetite to come uh, by and say hello and. Um, the, yeah, the, the local team here is doing their best to prepare the grounds for more people to come and join this um, endeavor. And yeah, I hand over back to Peter and uh, welcome for further discussions. Thank you, Max. Uh, uh, Kesha, uh, John, you writes in the chat, that's a heroic choice to go to such an extreme place to volunteer. And uh, congratulations on your choices. So you can take that, take those congratulations. Um, there is now uh, space and time for questions. If you're shy, uh, I've been told you can use the chat. If you would like to uh, use your voice, you can raise your hand. You can go to this reactions button on the menu below in Zoom. And there is a raise your hand functionality there. That'll tell us that you would like to ask a question and then I'll be happy to give you the floor. In the chat so far, only uh one uh real question which is uh the one asked by john uh about uh survival rate and it's just been seconded as a good question survival rate of trees uh do you have any information on that max or someone else yes it it depends on the irrigation system <laughs> if if i'm i'm thinking about our experiences of planting trees with um with uh, uh, irrigation hose, uh, the survival rate is maybe uh, 20, uh, um, 80, 70 percent. Uh, but we have invented uh, for larger tree belts a method with sprinkler irrigation that is more uh, robust and the survival rate uh, went up to 90 or so. So uh, because of this extra care where you plant and you have an irrigation system and you put some compost and you have people uh, walking uh, walking around it's it's quite uh, yeah the, the probability is high that trees are uh, staying in the in the ground and if they survived for the first three months then it's good to go okay um i i don't have many more questions still but i ha i do have one um you spoke a lot about uh, the economic goals that you see before you, and I think those are quite crucial for the sustainability of any project that you uh, are visioning how to um, fund it in, in the future. I'm kind of curious, and maybe people in the audience are also curious about your vision of what it will look like from an ecological viewpoint, say 10 years from now, uh, around 230, 2030. You have any any vision there, any, you know, dreams around what it will look like? Well, I would say the more diverse, the better. If I look now at Sekim Farm, you have to imagine a complete different setting where it's much more um, the feeling of a dense oasis with more um, the density of, of, of uh, different places for, um, for uh, trees and everything that are already developed. So. <clears throat> right now, 
when you come into the farm, it's quite uh, dominant that you see, ah, this is also an operation that is uh, striving towards creating financial income because you have uh, the need to cultivate cash crops. And of course, it's happening in a rotation according to biodynamic principles. But the more in, in some years, the more eco ecosystem functionality will be recognized. I'm talking about carbon credits, biodiversity credits, or, or, or the more you can do things that are more appropriate, maybe in terms of uh, water and so on, for the environment here. So I'm looking forward towards more broad diversity, but still a very healthy uh, uh, mix of what uh, the market needs in terms of good products for your health, for your uh, uh, food needs and nutrition, etc. Because that's the basis for, for, for a value creation. It's creating products that are actually needed. So I'm looking forward um, yeah, towards more diversity in the end. Great, thanks. Um, there's a raised hand, which I'll prioritize. Sheila? Yes, thank you. I, I was just, is, are you hearing an echo? Yes. Oh, I think that's because I, there are two pictures of me here. Yes, you're, you're in the call twice. Uh, so I'll put my question in the chat. I'm so sorry. Okay, well. It's not my twin either. <laughs> it was a heroic attempt, but put it in the chat. There are more questions thank you. In, the in the chat. Um, one of them is uh, from Kath. Uh, are you still accepting volunteer applications? You said it already. You're open to more people to come. Are, are you? Well, I would people? say uh, uh, one step after the other. Uh, I think that we need now half a year uh, for, for landing these uh, two uh, brave volunteers and for establishing a system. But from uh, quarter one, quarter two, I would say let's dream about taking another 10 volunteers 10. on board. Fantastic. And Rob asked, do those volunteers need uh, any experience before coming to Seekham? Do they need specific skill sets or training? The more uh, skills you offer, the better. I mean, in the end, you can also then apply for a job. Yeah. But the thing is, uh, what is needed is um, initiative and uh, uh, enthusiasm and uh, some of um, yeah, critical thinking, but also cultural adaptivity. You have to be very open for a new experience. And when this mix comes to the table, the rest can be solved, uh, I would say. Okay. Uh, th thanks. Um, going through this uh, questions, John has another one which um, has been seconded as an important question. If you're measuring surface temperatures, um, as he writes, this will be important to measure on the untreated sands and in the agroecology landscapes. Are you measuring that differentiation? No, only subjectively when I'm walking uh, bare feet on the ground. I really feel uh, it's too hot uh, during certain times of the day, but there's no structured way of measuring that yet. It, it's not easy because you do need to have data loggers and, and measure at the exact same time to get some scientific uh, val validity on that. Yeah. And I can tell you that we're trying to figure out if we can get some engineering company to give us a few hundred of those to spread around the camp so that we can start measuring those differences. And there's some interesting studies from the Las Plateau emerging also about warming and cooling uh, now that that's been going on for a while. Uh, another question, uh, more technical, is do you integrate swales? This is from Brent. Do you integrate swales to help retain <coughs> water? Well, actually, we have absolutely almost no um, rainwater falls or flooding situation or something where this would be needed. What, what, what is actually happening is that we have, we have the situation that around six meters uh, below the ground, there's a clay layer, um, which makes the runoff water that is sinking uh, lower uh, to move laterally to the lowest point of the farm and probably also taking runoff water from the other farms around us. So there was, there was a natural lake that was built. And we are trying to, to, to you know, capitalize on that because 
we we make this lake uh, as a source for for new uh, irrigation and lake is not maybe what you uh, uh, think about of, of a lake it's like 5000 or 10000 um, uh, cubic meters uh, high and from that one you can uh, irrigate again uh, uh, so that's a promising watering capturing uh, thing or technique that would be also highly relevant for the whole oasis in order to reuse some of the extracted groundwater okay um great i'm just gonna dump questions on you max and you just i hope you can answer them all there's one that is uh from nick uh i haven't heard of this but any thoughts on the proposal to refill the katara depression with mediterranean seawater i don't know if you've heard about it not specified sorry uh, no I, I i cannot answer on that Okay, I can, and I, maybe uh, Nick uh, send us a link where that plan is posted, and we can uh, we can all look at it uh, through the chat. Then Chris from our brand new member of the movement, uh, Pachamama in in South Africa, asks, and I understand this question if you're brand new. Do you have any advice for new camps with limited organizational capacity regarding the balance between the value chain development and organizational networking? And partnerships, and I think where I, that I know where that comes from, Chris, because we are quite in your face with questions as ERC. But anyway, Max, how do you balance these things? You have to work on all the fields. As I said, the piano came with a tractor. The, the first trees came with a medicinal plant in the desert that was contracted to a company that wanted to buy the extracts, and so on. I don't know where the sweet spot is. I, I'm sure that life will come to you with an opportunity to have an uh, economic business lead for any value creation on the farm that then can be flanked with, uh, with uh, biodiversity or ecological functions with culture and so on. So I think the, 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 a good entry now or to test my theory would be have a look at carbon credit generation. It can kickstart a, a very a good um, mechanism of you starting it or finding uh, investments. Okay, great. Uh, I'm taking note of the time. Uh, we promised this would be an hour. We're nearly at the hour, but I have a few more questions. Max, are you okay with more questions? Are you willing to stay longer? Great. Uh, Sheila, if, uh, if I could add just something frozen, everybody is. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, John, may, may I complete the questions and then come back to you? Hopefully. Um, Sheila uh, put her question uh, after we heard the echo in the chat, which is she's with uh, Facing Future TV. John's connected to that also uh, for the copy accreditation. Uh, there's quite a few people uh, being uh, featured on F Facing Future TV. And she would like to be in touch with you. Um, is it okay <laughs> that she approaches you? Sorry, I should have read that to the end and we could have done that offline. Uh, Max, is that okay? You want to be oh, on TV? Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, back to you. Uh, Sheila, we'll, we'll get you in touch. Uh, Peggy asks, uh, when the trees are large enough, will rain be possible? This is, of course, the theory of weather makers if ecosystems start to grow. It starts yeah. to rain again. Have you any thoughts on that, Max? Um, no, I was inspired by, by, by John and the weather makers. And someone, I don't know, said somewhere maybe that you need 100 square kilometers in order to start really to have some impact on the, on the weather uh, cycle. So I don't know uh, how that feels like, but it, it's much, much bigger. And it, it, this uh, whole Bahareya Oasis is a first step in this direction. But I'm really keen on hearing the outcomes from the Sinai project. The weather makers are active there. And I hope to, to see a breakthrough and I hope to benefit on a, on a regional level. And I think then we can kind of create an effect. Um, at, at least that's a, that's a crazy scenario. And I think uh, we have to be crazy for that. 
Yeah, there is. There are studies on the Lust Plateau, and there was an effect. Uh, climate conditions changed pre precipitation, but the Lust Plateau revegetation also significantly changed pre precipitation. Uh, but I'm going to continue down to the questions, and then I know John has a response to Chris's question, so I'll give you the floor soon, uh, John. Hans Schut, whom I think you know, uh, asks, uh, does this lake offer <coughs> any chance of trees surviving without irrigation? in the longer term. I guess this is a reflection on the 100 year water supply. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, there, there were some, um, uh, I, I forgot the name of the species, but we just uh, drove by uh, some acacia, I think, that was uh, uh, sitting there. Uh, we have planted it in the beginning of the 2010 uh, or 11, and then during the revolution and all that, it didn't get water. So after three years of getting water, five years of getting no water, it's still alive. It's a promising, uh, we don't know why. Uh, we have uh, two, three of these trees. Um, we have to find out uh, what happened. Um, uh, and I don't say that's the usual scenario. Usually that doesn't work, but we have certain anomalies uh, here that we investigate further. And, and I, I think there are some tree species that really can uh, make it a long time without water, but expanding this farm without water, I think it's very, very unlikely. Yeah, it's a stubborn tree. Um, John, you wanted to break in, I think, in response to Chris's question, who answered in the chat that ERC is not the version. Thank you, uh, Chris. But, John, um, actually, I wanted to talk about a couple of things. Um, uh, on the one hand, there is a, a, a uh, a non-native plant, a non-native tree, Casarina pine, and it's salt tolerant, it's very hardy, and it has one phenomenon where it uh, it basically sheds its needles whenever there's insufficient water and then returns it, so it cr creates a huge amount of biomass below, you know, on the, on, the, on the surface of the sand in this case. and. Um, I saw this in in Habiba camp, so if you do have a chance to talk to uh, Magid again, you might discuss with this, and I'll try to document it further when I'm in, in Nueva this time. But uh, it created, so the Israelis built a, <coughs> a farm uh, in, uh, in Nueva that no one could run after the the Sinai Peninsula was given given back to um, Egypt. So what was interesting is that underneath the Casarina pine, which they completely circled the the farm with, so it's a complete. Actually, barrier. Michael just joined the call. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. So. So together with Maggot, we went to visit this Israeli kind of kibbutz farm or community farm that had been put up. And the, the Casarina pine completely surrounded it. And, and below it was almost a meter high. And you know that, that they came in 67, so probably 68 was when they planted it. And I think they returned it. I don't remember when they returned the Sinai to, but anyway, from, it would be from, from um, 60, 68 until now. That's how long it took to grow a meter of organic material. And if, and there's another finding that I saw in Kenya, that there is a symbiotic insect called the, uh, red-legged millipede, which loves to eat casarina pine needles. And what was the name of this, uh, of this uh, companion? The red-legged millipede. You can find it in the film I did on Rwanda called Forests of Hope, but it's actually looking at what happened in Kenya in Mombasa at the Holler Park. So okay. Rene, this is Rene Holler's uh, inspiration, and it was very seriously studied by a number of 
masters and PhD students back in the in the day of you know 20 25 years ago something like that. but uh, it works and uh, right. so those are very hardy plants and then I, I wanted to mention and speak to that question of the hundred square kilometers this comes from Professor Mian Mian's work about how do you reach critical mass for condensation and precipitation and so this is a question of whether you have available moisture in the air and obviously in the desert you have very little but if you reach 21 grams per kilogram 20 21 approximately 21 grams of moisture for a kilogram of air and you have nucleation so you you need to have something that the droplets or the clouds can form around and that's generally bacteria which is exhaled by plants and if it's not that what is it it might be sand or 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 dust in like a dust storm or you know so if you have the situation where it rains and you're, everything is covered with dirt, then the nucleation is coming from a sandstorm or a dust storm. But if you have clean water raining down, this is more to do with uh, nucleation from bacteria exhaled from plants. So there's quite a lot of work on this, but I, I don't know how, exactly how it... Um, it fits for, you know, Wahat, but it'll be fun to continue to follow that. And then the other thing would be about the temperature differentials. I think this is going to be hugely important. I was just meeting with um, uh, uh, what's his, uh, I'm having a senior moment now that I've turned 70. Let's see. Um, uh, what? Oh, just just one second. While you're searching, there's 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 stuff happening in the chat also. First, I realize people are joining us now. This is the usual time zone confusion. I apologize, but we have been together for an hour, so you will have just missed Max's uh, <laughs> presentation. Uh, this is this is John just showed something in the camera, but because of the blurring, it's kind of interesting. We just see a face, but then it's John, and you've disappeared. Okay. Anyway, okay, well that's uh, that's Tony Ronaldo or Renado, who's working with World Vision, and he's gotten the uh, what they call the alternative Nobel Prize for his his work with farmer led natural regeneration. So if there's existing root systems, this is, this is his new book called The Forest Underground. And um, it's, it's interesting because in West Africa, in many places, in uh, Niger, where he worked for 17 years, most of the trees had been cut down, but they didn't take out the stumps. And so they were still alive. And when he, when he managed to allow um, co coppicing to take place and then selected specific branches to save and 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 uh, kind of removed the others as uh, and used those for mulch he lowered the surface temperatures and he's finding quite interesting changes there which is bringing back perennial springs in the area so study the work of tony and um, learn about his work with um, world vision and they're trying to spread this so i think you could work very closely with them at the moment maybe you can share that book title in the chat john uh paula phipps in the chat says that when it comes to water used by trees that uh, Akira Miyawaki's method of creating fast-growing biodiverse native species, mini forests, found that water for three years was necessary, but after that it was no longer needed. I'm not sure if that was in desert circumstances, where there's very little water in the air, as John just said, but uh, maybe you already know of that. Um, the, short, the short answer to what John said, 
The Casarina tree is really excellent, especially as a first mover to make windbreak systems um, uh, available. And uh, it's it's fast growing and so like a very a very good. So we are using it. I would say more than fifty percent. And what you can see beautifully is after forty five years in the main farm, you see these Casarina trees being already very big and huge, and it's like a standing of an older generation of the first movers now fading a little bit out and other species are coming in much more prominently. And it's a really beautiful scenario how you see that those species are really good for the beginning. And yes, they produce a lot of biomass, but it's also acid biomass. So you, you have to have a trade-off in the end uh, with the species. But uh, it's very good for the start, very good for the first uh, two, three decades uh, to hold the space for new species to arrive. And it's a wonderful thing. And just short info, our water ground level is at 40 meters Hi. and uh, higher in the depth. So it's really difficult to uh, get roots, uh, roots to access that at the moment. Okay, yeah, that will be difficult. Um... The official hour has ended, and uh, before we throw another tree on the campfire for us to sit around and chat some more, uh, maybe I will tie it up uh, for now. Um, thank you very much, Max, for that presentation. And uh, when I see how complete you think about a project with culture, education, uh, economic development, revenue streams, uh, new forms of finance that you're pioneering, uh, just the whole economy of love concept, as, as you describe it, that, 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 that full circle of activities that are there. So I'm, I'm finding that path for humanity to fit on this planet. And it's, it's every single time I hear about it, I'm completely impressed. I hope everyone else was too. Uh, before people start to sign off, thank you so much uh, for that presentation, Max. And uh, I wish your, your volunteers uh, a, a great journey uh, in the world of Seachem and uh, look forward to what you bring to the planet uh, after you've done that journey, uh, because the planet needs many people to, uh, to participate. Um, in the chat we have, but we will do it again, post it to the economy of love, uh, dot net URL. Uh, and I will, uh, because I've been asked to, but I also believe in this, and I think John will support me in this, if people like every every other everyday people start supporting this work, and you know, you know, and right now in the media, people are forced to choose between heating and eating in England and also in the Netherlands. And we're noticing that people are choosing between heating, eating and donating. Uh, we're getting fewer and fewer donations and people tell us it's because financially things are difficult. Uh, hopefully people are willing to do a one cup of coffee per month less and help with this. And if you aren't donating yet, please think of that. If you have friends who aren't donating to this movement yet, please tell them uh, because it's not getting easier to support this work. Seekem will be fine, but many others aren't as uh, well thought through yet as Seekem is, and we're helping them on that pathway. So do think of that. And, and uh, Kath has shared a link where you can lead people to. It's, it's quite important. Um, again, thanks, uh, Max, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Do stay along for... Uh, the, the fire that will reheat with more conversation. I want to thank Kath uh, of the team for preparing this. Christina, uh, who in her journey back to Jordan got sick. Uh, she's in Jordan now and couldn't host this meeting. That was the plan. Thank you also for all the work you've put into it. And John, again, for being here. Um, the fire isn't out yet. Uh, the Zoom isn't turned off yet. So please, uh, if you wish, continue to be part of the conversation. I think we should stop spotlighting people so that everyone can turn on their cameras. And if you have anything you would like to bring in, ask considerations or share. Uh, that's what you do at a fire. Uh, we meet each other and happy to meet all of you. Uh, and uh, let's have uh, a conversation. And then we'll close and we'll see hopefully all of you again next month at our next fireside.
moments. 